Right, I think we really touched on most of this at the beginning, talking about blockade, and it's fairly straightforward. Um, I think almost all of us use phenoxybenzamine as a preoperative preparation. It's extremely effective, it's one we have most experience of. It's not a very nice drug, any of you who have been on it will know it's not very nice, and I will always warn the patients that I'm going to treat them, I make them feel awful, but hopefully only for a short period of time. Uh, there's obviously the postural hypotension as you initially vasodilate and you then start to get out of bed and fall over. Nasal stuffiness is quite unpleasant. And a third feature which maybe caused some initial embarrassment, it was actually a patient who told me, who took me to one side, it was a young man, and said since starting the, phen the phenoxybenzamine, he developed absent ejaculation, which when I then went back, prompted by him to look in the urological literature, in fact is well described with phenoxybenzamine, but interestingly does not seem to be a problem with any of the other drugs like doxazacin and terazacin. And doxazacin in particular is a drug that's easy to use and relatively free of side effects. Um, I will usually later, as we all know, then add in a beta blocker and I tend to use propranolol because it's the one which we've been using longest, have most experience of, it's not absolutely essential, I think, to use in every case, but it's useful to add as a second line. Uh, I personally have no experience of alpha methyl tyrosine. I think, Carol, you've got to use it a few times. Uh, it's usually, I think, not strictly going to be necessary. I would just say that there are fixed doses for phenoxybenzamine in, in, the, in most of the uh, pharmacological guides, but actually, I think it depends very much on how severe the catecholamine excess is. And if the patient has got levels which are 100 times normal, I'm quite happy to go over the guidelines because you're just blocking more of it. Um, we use a fair amount of radionuclide therapy, radio labelled MIBG. I think it's an extremely useful drug. It requires very little from the patient other than in to be in a quasi sealed room for three or four days, and it's very well tolerated. Following Dr. Fitzgerald in San Francisco, I started using very high doses, but uh, it really, I ran into some problems, and I've gone down to regular small doses with very good tolerance. I don't have much experience in this type of tumour using radio-labelled octreotide or octreotate, but, and I hear what Carol said earlier, he thinks it's less effective than MIBG, and that may be true, but if the patient's negative on an MIBG scan, I think it's certainly a reasonable option. And again, other than the availability and expense, it's something you as patients, I think, will tolerate very nicely. Chemotherapy, I tend to use very little. Uh, again, we had a bit of a discussion yesterday. I'm rather negative against it, having used it quite extensively over the years. CBD is one triple combination of which we have most experience. I think the NIH data suggested it had, was quite effective in the short term, but not very effective in the long term, and survival changes were not particularly marked. It's arguable, but certainly I'm not very enthusiastic about it. Temozolamide I'm beginning to use more. The data are very limited, but it's certainly a drug that's easy to use and very well tolerated and patient-friendly. And since we're not going for cure, I would first try and use a drug that patients get on best with. And lastly, we're now in the region of targeted molecular therapy like sunitinib and I feel slightly uncomfortable I'm an endocrinologist and not an oncologist and obviously if I'm going to use chemotherapy I will get an oncologist to work with me which brings us to the MDT. Um, with these new drugs like Everolimus, Red 001, sunitinib and others I'm not quite clear who's going to be able to look after these drugs and supervise them properly in terms of our patient care. It may be that those of us who use it will just, it's so facto, by that fact, become expert in their use. I'm not sure whether we always need an oncologist. But I think that really brings us to the point that all patients with complex diseases, as anyone other than the very, very simple benign FEO is, end up at an MDT. And in the UK, there's a compulsion for us to have MDTs in a variety of diseases and to have them recognised, written up, recorded, have an audit trail. And they're very, very useful because then you can get the oncologist, the radiologist, the pathologist, the surgeon, the endocrinologist, all at the same time in the same place. 
But just one caveat about it. Very often you ask my juniors, uh, what would you do with this patient? And the response is, take it to the MDT. Now that is not a therapeutic decision. That's in a, not exactly a cop-out, but it is a way of not making a decision at that point. And the second thing is, the MDT does not make a decision. Because everyone is at the MDT, except in a sense the most important person, that's the patient. And yet, in the final analysis, it has to be the individual specialist in consultation with the patient who then makes the decision as the most appropriate treatment. For example, you've got a patient with a malignant paraganglioma, doing extremely well, they're rescanned, and you find two to three five millimeter lesions just below the diaphragm, slightly MIBG avid. You have a series of options. You take it to the MDT. The, M the nuclear medicine doc says, fine, we can give MIBG, let's try that. So the surgeon jumps up and down and says, I can do that, I can scrape them all out. Or you can do nothing at all. They're very small, they're probably very slow growing, they be very indolent. And the final analysis, the decision, then depends on that specialist talking to that patient and finding out how they feel about the situation. Are they prepared to go through what could be quite major surgery? Would they rather wait a little longer? That ultimate decision, as I said, is always made between two people. So that's a very, very uh, flying overview. Anyone like to ask any questions? Um, not having actually had any of these treatments, I'm kind of curious what the, the side effects are for patients for like the MIBG and the Y90. Okay. We get a lot of questions. And... Sure. Um, the radionuclide, the radionuclide, and I have most experience with MIBG, and maybe Simone will tell us more about PRRT. Um, it's given as an intravenous infusion. The patient then goes to essentially a normal room, except it's lead-lined. And the approaches of staff to protect the staff from the patients are always very quick. So the food is popped in and then they rush out again. It's slightly claustrophobic because you are not allowed to leave the room while you're radioactive and, in a sense, a danger to other people. Uh, but the patient essentially <laughs> may get a little nausea in about 10% of cases, in about 2 to 3% may actually have some vomiting. Other than that, there's essentially in the short term no side effects, it's really very well tolerated. In the longer term there's a little bit of a problem in terms of an influence on bone marrow. So that's why I've gone back to using lower doses. But again that hasn't been a major problem. So I think on the whole, other than the expense, and currently they, they remain pretty horrendous, it's something which, as a patient, I, w I would feel is more acceptable than, say, long-term chemotherapy. Simona, would you agree with that? Thank you. Um, with the PRT, there may be um, also uh, some fever and some nausea and vomiting, which I've seen with my patients. And also, uh, with PRT, you may develop, uh, if you have uh, in your background some, um, you know, with pheochromocytoma, you may have you have hypertension, so you may have uh, problems with your kidney function, so you may develop some uh, a, a, a renal insufficiency. But usually with MIBG, I agree with you. Yeah, it's, it's very well tolerated.